If you're interested in aviation, you've probably spent enough time staring at airplanes to notice that there's a huge variety in the size and shape of airplane wings. I'm sure you've seen long wings, short wings, folding wings, sweat wings, anything you can imagine. Someone's probably already built and tested it. Why are there so many configurations though, and how do engineers come up with all these different designs? Let's look at the wing design for the Dark Air 1 to start to answer these questions. The design of any aircraft wing is governed by the mission requirements for that aircraft. So for the Dark Air 1, our mission is high speed, long range flight. You'll have sub requirements that feed into the mission requirements. For the Dark Air 1, I've got a couple of requirements written out here. There are more than this, but these are ones that are a little bit specific to the aerodynamics of the wing. We want to achieve a stall speed that's less than 60 knots. And then when the wing does stall, we want it to have a progressive stall that starts at the root of the wing and progresses towards the tip. I'll explain why in a minute. We also want to achieve really good efficiency for our design. It's really great to fly fast and fly far, but if you have to fill up a huge fuel tank at the end of the mission, that's not very fun. So efficiency is important to us. These two requirements are related to lift and this requirement is related to the drag on the wing. Lift and drag are the two fundamental aerodynamic forces on the wing. Once you have your requirements defined, we can start to rough out the design for our wing. I'll say that anytime you come up with a design, there are going to be trade-offs. Often you'll have conflicting requirements, and you're going to have to try to optimize the design in order to minimize how much you're compromising on each one of these requirements. Typically, high speed in cruise is going to be conflicting with low stall speed. Those are difficult to achieve at the same time. Our wing design for the Dark Air 1 looks kind of like this. This is a little scaled down drawing of the wing looking at it from the bottom of the wing because we can see our flaps. So we've got 23 feet 5 inches of wingspan, around 66 square feet of wing area, and the aspect ratio is around 8.3. Aspect ratio is the ratio of the wingspan to the average wing cord. And I mentioned before, fundamental forces lift and drag. Those look like this. If we were to take a cross section through our wing, we'd see an airfoil shaped cross section like this. If you draw a line between the leading edge of the wing and the trailing edge, that's called the cord line. And if you measure the angle between the oncoming airflow and the cord line, that's called our angle of attack. So how do we go about achieving these requirements with our design? I think the best way to answer that is to dig into a little bit of the math. We'll look at the basic lift and drag equations for a wing. So we've got lift over here in green. Green is good for lift. Uh, drag is over here, drag is red, drag is bad. Okay, here's our basic lift equation for the wing. L equals one half rho V squared times S times C sub L. I know there's a lot of variables here. I'll talk through each one to make sense of all this. One half rho V squared in blue, that's our dynamic pressure, basically the kinetic energy of our airflow. Rho is our air density. That's a function of altitude. Density is gonna be highest at low altitudes near sea level. And then as we climb up in the atmosphere, density is going to drop. And it's important to note that our lift is proportional to the density, so the wing is going to be able to make more lift in denser air. So that's down low. As we climb up, the wing is going to have a harder time making lift at higher altitude for a constant air velocity. That's V. V is our airspeed or velocity. The lift is proportional to velocity squared. If we double our airspeed, that's going to multiply our lift by a factor of four, or quadruple the lift. And this is really important for our stall speed requirement because our velocity, our airspeed is lower near stall during takeoff and landing. So if we cut our velocity in half, that's going to give our wing one quarter the amount of lift. So this governs a lot of our stall speed requirements for achieving our wing design. Okay, S is the wing area. You remember I mentioned before, our wing area is 66 square feet for the Dark Arrow 1 wing. C sub L is our lift coefficient. That's a non-dimensional number that we add into the equation to account for the cross-sectional shape of the airfoil and the angle of attack. We can measure the coefficient of lift for any given airfoil by running it through a wind tunnel. We'll measure the lift on a little wing built with that airfoil at a bunch of different angles of attack and then calculate uh, the lift coefficient. So each different uh, airfoil will have a different lift curve that looks like this. So we'll measure lift coefficient at a range of angles of attack to establish a lift curve like this. Different airfoils have different lift curves. At low angle of attack, the coefficient of lift is small. As we climb up in angle of attack, the lift coefficient increases. At some point, you reach a maximum lift coefficient, and then beyond that, the wing stalls or the lift coefficient drops. This is where the wing is gonna be operating near stall, is near our maximum lift coefficient. So we wanna pick an airfoil 
with a very high maximum lift coefficient in order to minimize our stall speed. There's another design trick we can do to increase our lift coefficient, and that's by adding flaps in the design. Flaps are a deflectible control surface at the trailing edge of the wing that looks like this. So we're using split flaps in our design. They deflect from the bottom surface of the wing only, and that's going to increase our maximum lift coefficient. It's going to shift the lift curve up and to the left. We have the lift curve for the airfoil with the flaps deployed here. You can see that's going to give us a higher lift coefficient than when we don't have flaps. When we're designing our wing, the two big parameters that we're going to be deciding on are the wing area and lift coefficient. This is going to be a function of what airfoil we pick. The wing area is the other parameter. So it's a little bit of an iterative approach when we start sizing the wing and picking the airfoils and the, the wing plan form. We'll start with a basic concept and then run some calculations using this equation to figure out how does our wing perform in terms of stall, uh, lift, drag, that sort of thing. I think there's this idea with a lot of these modern software tools that you can just plug in a couple parameters and it spits out your design. Realistically, we use these tools for analysis after we have a basic concept already established. So the two things we can do to minimize our stall speed is pick a large wing area and pick an airfoil that has a high maximum lift coefficient. The other thing that's important around stall is the stall behavior. We want the stall to develop at the root of the wing and progress outward towards the tips. The reason we want that to be the case is because our ailerons that provide roll control, those are out at the wing tips, and we want to be able to keep the wings level, maintain roll control as the stall develops and as we recover from the stall. If the wing tips were to stall first, the wing could drop and that'd be bad if you're at low altitude and you need to recover from your stall. So we want the wing tips to stall last. How do we actually accomplish that design goal though? Uh, there are a couple different ways. One of the simple ways is by picking a plan form shape for your wing that naturally achieves a progressive stall. A rectangular plan form, or we also call that a Hershey bar wing, will naturally stall at the root first and then have it progress out towards the tips. That's a pretty simple proven method. Another method is to employ wing washout, that's basically twist in the wing. So we mount the wing tip airfoils at a lower angle of attack relative to the root, or you could think of it as the root is at a higher angle of attack relative to the wing tips. So it's forcing the root of the wing closer to that stall angle of attack and forcing the root to stall first. There's another method, and this is the method that we used in the Dark Arrow 1, is we picked airfoils that stall at different angles of attack for the root and for the tip. And that looks like this on our lift curve. So our root airfoil stalls at a lower angle of attack relative to the tip airfoil, and that helps us achieve a progressive stall. The reason we picked this airfoil selection approach rather than using the Hershey bar wing with washout is because this design gives a little bit less drag compared to the Hershey bar wing with washout. We're getting into the drag topic now. We want to minimize drag in order to maximize our efficiency. How do we go about doing that? We'll look at the drag equation to answer that question. Here's our drag equation. D equals one half rho v squared times S times C sub D. You'll notice that the drag equation looks almost identical to the lift equation, and it pretty much is identical except for this last coefficient at the end. This is our drag coefficient compared to the lift coefficient for the lift equation. Because this equation is so similar to our lift equation, a lot of the same basic principles are going to apply. Drag is proportional to the air density. Drag is proportional to the velocity squared. If we double our velocity, that's going to quadruple the wing drag. Uh, the wing drag is also proportional to the wing area. If we double the wing area, that's going to double the drag. So you can already start to see that these two equations are going to be conflicting in terms of our requirements and our mission goals. So if we want to minimize our stall speed, we might pick a large wing area, but that's also going to give a lot of drag. This drag coefficient at the end is actually made up of a couple components. We have parasitic drag, that's this C sub little d, and then we also have the lift induced drag, which is this term. I'll talk through these each individually to make sense of this. So our parasitic drag coefficient is based on the shape of the airfoil and the angle of attack of the airfoil. We can measure the parasitic drag coefficient just like we measured the lift coefficient, we run our airfoil through the wind tunnel at a range of angles of attack and then measure how much drag it generates. The parasitic drag has two subcomponents, the form drag and the skin friction drag. The form drag is dependent on how thick the airfoil is. The form drag is really uh, how much drag is generated by the airfoil splitting the air apart. So a thicker airfoil is going to make more form drag. We can minimize form drag by using a thinner airfoil. 
there is a little bit of a limit on how thin we can go with the airfoil because thinner airfoils tend to stall at a lower angle of attack and produce a lower maximum lift coefficient compared to thicker airfoils. So we're a little bit boxed in on how thin we can go with the airfoil cross section. The real way we can minimize parasitic drag is by minimizing skin friction drag. So skin friction drag comes about because air is viscous, it's a little bit sticky. As air flows over the wing, the air kind of sticks to the wing surface and that causes skin friction drag. The minimum drag condition for a skin friction drag comes about when we have full laminar flow. So the air starts to flow over the airfoil in nice thin laminar sheets and eventually it trips up and starts to transition to turbulent flow over the wing skin. Turbulent flow is kind of chaotic. It's a bunch of little vortices and eddies, and that's a lot more drag compared to laminar flow. So we want to maximize how much laminar flow we have on our wing. There's two ways we can maximize laminar flow. One is just making the surface of the wing smooth. So that's part of why we picked composite materials for our design. It's really easy to make nice smooth surfaces on your wing with composite materials. If we were to use riveted aluminum, rivet heads will tend to trip up laminar flow. Even if we used flush rivets, Flush rivets will still produce a little bit of a wrinkly skin and that'll trip up laminar flow. So composites do a really good job of creating a surface that's conducive to laminar flow. The other thing we can do to minimize the skin friction drag is pick airfoil shapes that are more conducive to preserving laminar flow. We have airfoils called laminar flow airfoils that maximize laminar flow. Technically, all airfoils have a little bit of laminar flow, but the laminar flow airfoils maximize the amount of laminar flow. So that's what we used on the Dark Air 1 to minimize our skin friction drag. The other component of our drag for the wing is the lift induced drag. That's this term here and it's dependent on the lift coefficient squared. It's related to lift. So we get lift induced drag because the wing is not hundred percent efficient at generating lift. What can happen is we have high pressure on the bottom of the wing, low pressure on top and the air wants to flow from high pressure to low pressure following that pressure gradient and the air curls around the wingtips and produces little vortices or tornadoes at the wingtips and that uh, produces induced drag. The main way we can minimize lift induced drag is by picking a higher aspect ratio wing. That's this term in our lift induced drag component. So if we maximize the aspect ratio of the wing, that's going to minimize lift induced drag. We already mentioned that the aspect ratio for the Dark Arrow 1 wing is around 8.3. We found that that's a good balance of minimizing uh, induced drag while still being able to fit the wing in a two-car garage. When you sum together your parasitic drag and your lift induced drag, you'll get the total drag on the wing that looks like this. So this is drag versus airspeed. You'll see that our parasitic drag goes up exponentially as airspeed increases, while our lift induced drag decreases as an inverse square with airspeed. When you sum them together, you get total drag that looks like this. And you'll notice that there's a local minima here. We did say that we wanted to minimize our total drag on our wing, but technically we're not going to be operating at this local minima for cruise conditions. We're actually flying out here because our wing is oversized for cruise flight. It's sized based on the stall speed requirements. So we have a lot of extra wing area that's along for the ride in cruise flight condition, pushing our total drag out here. And this kind of explains why we don't use winglets on our wing. A lot of people ask, why don't you have a winglet on your wingtips? Those are little uh, vertical fins attached to the wingtip that help block these wingtip vortices and scavenge some of that energy that goes into those wingtip vortices. If we were to add in winglets, that would technically reduce our lift induced drag a little bit because we're operating out here though, our lift induced drag is already very small but our parasitic drag is high. Adding winglets would just increase our parasitic drag a lot more than it would reduce induced drag, so it would increase our total drag. And that's not really good for the efficiency. So you can see based on these equations, how we go about sizing our wing and picking different parameters like the wingspan, the aspect ratio, or the airfoil selection. And you can see that there are a lot of trade-offs and it starts to make sense why we can't do it all. People ask, oh, why can't you have your stall speed maybe 30 miles an hour? Technically, we're going to be trading off uh, our high speed performance. Everything's a balance. So lift and drag are the two big fundamental aerodynamic forces we're concerned about. Next up, we're going to talk about how do we build structures strong enough to support these lift loads in flight. We'll get to that in the next video. So thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one.